at uh, Southern Methodist University, he completed his PhD work at Duke University, and since that time has taught at a number of schools, including Garrett Evangelical Seminary, not far from us, and uh, Marquette University just up the road in Milwaukee. Professor Long is a highly prolific author. He's written on a number of diverse topics, including just a, a few highlights from his publishing career. John Wesley's Moral Theology from 2005, Divine Economy, Theology and the Market from 2000, Speaking of God, Theology, Language and Truth from 2009, The Perfectly Simple Triune God, Aquinas and His Legacy 2016, and many others. I should also add that Steve, or Professor Long, is a, an attentive and godly mentor to his students, and here I speak from personal experience. So it's really a delight for me personally, and I'm thrilled to have uh, Dr. Long here with us. Would you join me in welcoming him? Thank you, David. I'm not sure mentor is the right word since uh, uh, all I had to do was point you to the library and the work was over. That was really, <laughs> really nice. It's a delight to respond to Professor Sonderegger. It's just a, it's a real joy. Uh, I'm not sure I'm the most appropriate one to respond, however, because most of these responses, you, to use an old scholastic axiom, you distinguish in order to unite. Uh, but I have hardly any differences with her work, and so um, I could just respond by saying, yes, what she said. But um, um, I've admired her work it's from her early book on... Um, that Jesus Christ was born a Jew, Karl Barth, and the Theology of History? Mm, doctrine of Israel. The, doc the Doctrine of Israel, and the most recent uh, first volume of Systematic Theology, which I think has really reshaped the nature of Systematic Theology. If you haven't read it, it's a must read. Mm -hmm. And it's also a, a beautiful read. It, uh, is in, it's infused with uh, someone who has spent her life not only as an academic theologian, but very much a theologian of the church. Mm -hmm. So thank you for that. I very much appreciate her work and this essay because I think there is both a judiciousness to what she does for us as well as a boldness. And that's an unusual combination. There's a judiciousness in that she reminds us not to overstate our case. Don't overstate biblical answers to scientific questions. And when we lack that judiciousness, we can create serious harm for ourselves. But on the other hand, there's also this boldness in which she reminds us not to capitulate biblical answers to scientific answers. So within sort of the, with, that, with that, that judiciousness and that boldness, both of which I think are, are virtues, she asks us to address this question that we are addressing really the next few days. How do we relate theology, scripture, science, and creation? And I'd like to raise four points that are sort of questions and invite her to decide which she thinks might be the most useful in her response. The first is how, given her work, both in systematic theology and her address today, how should we think about the relationship between divine power and creation? Divine power and creation. Now, in her systematic theology, she states this, divine power is the mystery of holiness and humility together. Perfect power is holy humility. And if you were attentive to her lecture, you heard some of that in the first part of the essay about God's power. God's not a power over creation, but the very fact that God allows creation itself to be generative is a sign of divine power as holy humility. And I just wanted to give you the opportunity to, to uh, elaborate on that position because I think it's, it's such an important position, the way we think about God, not simply in terms of the first cause, but God as this constant donating source of being. How would that help us think well about creation and about science. The second question or con I'd like to, to raise is this notion of a limit concept. For there's this in intriguing duality which partakes of that judiciousness and that boldness that I already mentioned. 
in her presentation to us. On the one hand, she reminds us that, that there's a limit concept of science when we read scripture. And she made a very good case about that in terms of uh, not thinking about um, uh, decaying carcasses generating life, even though you might be able to find a biblical argument for that. <coughs> None of us would do that. So at, at times, we don't want to allow biblical interpretation, theology, to conflict with truths of science. You know, Raising questions of astrophysics in the first chapter of Genesis is not the most judicious a way to proceed, or uh, asking questions of maritime architecture of, of Noah's Ark. On the other hand, she inverts that concept and says there are times when there is, if you will, a biblical or theological concept, a, a limit concept to science. And there's that boldness uh, uh, reflected that it's not as if these two are running on parallel tracks, if I interpret the project correctly. That theology and scripture does have something to say to science and the way it presents the world to us. And the question, of course, is how do you know when to, to use which? When do you say, yes, let's be careful here uh, as we present the faith that we don't overstep the limit concept of science? And when do we be bold in our theological and biblical uh, limit concept and say to science, um, you know, wait a minute. I mean, I, I remember when, when my children were little, we'd watch Marty Stauffer's Wild America. And I don't know, some of you might remember that very sedate show compared to what they have today. But, but Marty would always say, you know, he'd have the fox chasing down the rabbit in the snow. And he'd have the fox jumping on the rabbit and ripping its head off and blood going everywhere. And, and Marty in his sort of uh, Mr. Rogers voice would say, and don't worry, it's just the way of nature. <laughs> but is it? You know, is it? Is nature predatory? Uh, or is this a sign of something gone wrong? So how do we know when, when it's a limit concept of science, when it's a limit concept of theology? The third point is the point of eschatological expectation. Eschatological expectation. I very much, and this is something I've always appreciated about Professor Sonderegger's work, is that there's a will to truth. It doesn't always follow trends, and it doesn't, it, it, it doesn't even follow trends in that it has to buck the trends. <laughs> it, uh, um, and, and she has given us an, an essay which says, yes, there is something unique to human being, and that's a good thing, that um, we are also on the sixth day, like other animals, we are part of, that, of the, uh, the, the, the creatures that God has, has made, but there's something unique about us. That we are, to use Delubach's words, I don't know if you would uh, go by these, but we're the suspended middle, both natural and supernatural. It's why we do science. Um, I had a one pet animal, one pet dog. I, I'd never have a cat because the only thing I feed that treats me with contempt are my children. <laughs> no. Um, <laughs> um, that's not true. <laughs> But, um, you know, I mean, I, and, that, and that dog was amazing. He had a kind of rationality. Mm -hmm. He would know things that I wouldn't even know. Like when my wife was coming home, we would know before we could hear anything because he'd be at the, at the door. But I couldn't talk to him about Heidegger's philosophy of technology. I mean, that wasn't possible. <laughs> I mean, there was a distinction. And, and I think you've done a very nice job sort of helping us identify that distinction without removing us from the natural. So the animals are, are purely natural beings, I think you said. Mm -hmm. We are both natural and supernatural. And as part of that, we can also um, make things. That we also have this ability to, to create the artificial. So we're natural and supernatural, but we also have this natural and artificial. Now that raises the question for me of eschatological <coughs> expectation. And that is to say, if the animals are purely natural, what's the role of the other creatures in terms of eschatological hope? And I think that's an important question because it will help us know how we should attend to them. And you've already begun to answer that, I think, by um, at least offering a, a sort of subtle criticism of some of the factory farming and some of the, the practices around us. And then finally, the last question, um, the most difficult question, that is the relationship between technology, politics, and ethics. 
You suggest that this distinction between natural and artificial, on the one hand, is a source of generativity. Uh, and, it's, it, and it has been, um, despite our critiques of cell phones and the fact that we all have them, or at least most of us. There's probably a few of you who are, are holier than the rest of us. But um, I remember when, when my wife was a missionary in Honduras when we first were married, and we were apart, there was one phone on the island. You'd have to make an appointment to see it, to, to, to use it once a week and wait in line. You know, And that was really hard. Now, the wonderful thing about that is we actually wrote letters to each other every day. Um, but you know, but it isn't. But on the so, so on one hand, the technology is not innocent. It brings with it certain encumbrances. It changes us. But on the other hand, it's not deterministic. It's not as if post-human evolution is inevitable. It's possible because of our role as as makers, as being able to turn things into uh, turn nature into culture, to to, to create the artificial. And that brings beautiful things as part of our vocation, I take it. Yeah. But on the other hand, it has to be done within the limits of, as you put it, natural constraint. Mm -hmm. And there, for me, is the difficult political and ethical question. How do we possibly go forward with all of the changes in technology that are coming our way and ad adhere to natural constraints? Because it seems to me that that can't be done simply on the basis of market realities. It requires politics. But I'm not sure we have a politics that can identify what the proper limits are that would allow us to, uh, to being human, that would allow us to know how to make those kinds of judgments. Um, I mean, I, I loved your, I loved, as, a, as an avid cyclist who, who's been a bicycle, bicycle commuter for 30 years, I loved your statement about the uh, horror of cars in major cities. Um, but you know, but, but who's going to decide, oh yes, let's turn these roads over to greenways so people can learn how to walk and ride a bike, uh, maybe even use a horse again. You know, that's, I mean, uh, who's going to make that kind of a judgment? How's that even feasible if those are some of the natural constraints, especially as we try to slow down the speed by which we live, as you also identified? And then related to that is the changing shape of work. The changing shape of work, which seems to be a mixed blessing. On the one hand, you noticed that you, you noted that with our artificial technological achievements, work is now 24/7. There is no time for jubilee or, or, or Sabbath. There's no time for Sabbath. In the Catholic Catechism, it says, "The Sabbath is a protest against the servitude of work." I love that. The Sabbath is a protest against the servitude of work. Now, it could be, I mean, work is changing in ways that are just be, because of what we've been able to do, that we have to think about it politically and theologically, but I'm not sure we know how, especially in the Protestant tradition, because we have turned work into a kind of idol. And we have forgot that your dignity doesn't come from your work. Um, but we assume that somehow the only thing that's dignified is work irrespective of the work, when in truth most of the people in the world do arduous work. I mean, is it really the case that some people have the vocation to clean toilets, you know, for other people? Is that really dignified? Is that, is that what it means to work? All, and all of this work, or, or to drive for Uber for 10 hours a day. And all of this is changing as these jobs are becoming replaced because of technology. Is it possible that we could have a, a new conception of, of where we find our dignity? And, and this is where the image of God would come, into uh, come in helpful as well. By rethinking the nature of work politically and theologically so that we understand that simply following the division of labor and doing a rote job for eight to 10 hours a day is not wherein a person's dignity exists. So is there also a, so there's a, a liability with technology with respect to work uh, that you've identified. Um, and I think it's, it, it pushes against creation. But is there a possibility with the new forms of technology that are about to emerge <laughs> that we might get a, a better theological and political account of work, remembering that arduous labor is judgment? Mm 
Just like, I mean, just like, I mean, when our first daughter was born, and my, my, my oldest daughter is expecting, I'm very excited about this. Um, uh, my son-in-law is sitting in here, so I, can, I have to be careful what I say, but I'm very excited about this. <laughs> but I remember mean, when, my, my, when my first daughter was born, you know, we use the Lamaze method, don't use anything artificial. Uh, you know, and, and you can breathe the pain away, you can breathe the pain away. And then finally my wife realized, no, you can't breathe this pain away. <laughs> you know, this, and this pain is no good. It's not fun. You know, thank God for um, uh, medicine that can take away the pain, right? It's a good thing. I'm glad we have it. I'm glad we use it. Is arduous labor like that something we need to be more intentional about in terms of this is judgment and Christ has redeemed it? So is that, is that also possible now uh, in the doctrine of creation? Okay, well, there's, I don't know if that, that's helpful, if there are any of those questions you'd like to address. Mm. Those are all wonderful, and I, I feel in turn like saying what he says, yes. <laughs> uh, um, maybe I should uh, uh, start with the um, eschatological expectation uh, as that's uh, concrete and move from there into some questions about labor and then these methodological um, questions about the limit concept to the exercise of that uh, and how that relates to um, human power and divine power. Um, I think one of the uh, striking things about the, the book of Revelation is the way in which it looks at the heavenly realm under several different categories. It's, it's uh, certainly uh, a throne room and an altar uh, with the uh, confessors and martyrs and the elect uh, around the Lord's throne and the Lamb. Uh, but it's also a place where there are these living creatures and they are there along with a stream and a tree that uh, bridges the, the stream. Uh, so we, we clearly have elements of a, um, a vision of completeness that draws on the days of creation uh, and certainly on the first psalm. And all of these are part of the uh, divine consummation and fullness of the world and of creatures. And we also have this image of the city, uh, the heavenly city coming down to the earth, uh, inscribed with the names of prophets and apostles. Uh, so there is something about the built world that Augustine picks up so powerfully in his image of the city of God. Uh, so the heavenly places are not only natural, the, they're not only the organic and the uh, living beasts uh, and the uh, human beings who are also created on that day, but the uh, civilized cultural world is also part of the heavenly realms. Uh, so that that suggests to me that in our expectation for God's deliverance of this world and the healing and elevation of the world, that we will be brought in the midst of things brought to their perfection. Hmm. And that is true of the, the dear things of the earth, the, the beautiful, natural things that we long to be in the midst of and uh, all of our um, physicians and nurses tell us if we spend more time there, we will be healthier. Uh, those things will be there in their perfection, uh, in this 
a glorious way that speaks of God's hand in them. Mm -hmm. But I think also the artificial will be there, mm -hmm. it, um, manifesting its tie to scripture it, by the apostles and the prophets inscribed on its bases. Um, but it will be wholly cultural. It, it will be the great symbol of uh, human culture bearing, the, uh, the house, the, uh, the temple, the structure, the walls, the gates. And it will be ornamented. So it will also be beautiful in the way that uh, artistic work can be both artificial and, and deeply beautiful. So I, I think we can hope that the world not only of nature but of culture and of the newly fashioned will be in some way perfected. Uh, uh, neither nature nor artifact destroyed, but perfected. Uh, so that um, I, I think we might broaden our conception of the beatific vision by using the Book of Revelation in this way. So the uh, predominant um, traditional question uh, about the Visio Dei, uh, how it is that the elect see God face to face, uh, could be placed in this larger context of all things brought to their perfection. Hmm. Okay. And just mm. to yeah. comment on that, because I've, I've been thinking, and you, and you bring this to mind, because I love that response. It really strikes me that in Revelation 21 and in the prophets, the role of the nations, mm -hmm. that the mm -hmm. glories, the, the, the glories of the nations, of the nations mm -hmm. are brought into the city. Yeah. And uh, even, I mean, I teach Adam Smith every semester and nobody yeah. knows, you know, the wealth of nations is from mm -hmm. Isaiah 65. I mean, yeah. you know, it's a, it's a secularized, imminentized version. Mm -hmm. But what, I wonder if, if we thought that, that God has created the nations, not necessarily the nation states, there's a difference, but the mm -hmm. nations, yeah. peoples, right. and has given them each a glory and that our, and one of the tasks of create mm -hmm. of, of good doctrine of creation is to find the glory of all the nations. Mm. I just wonder if that might make us a gentler people, mm. <laughs> you know, right. more less prone to kill other nations and think that they're always <laughs> adversaries rather than, oh yeah, all these nations are created by God, they have a glory. I wonder what it is. Mm -hmm. Right. So we could we could start thinking about the concept of natural kind those things mm. made according, after their likeness, after their kind. Mm. That's a striking phrase in Genesis, and that term is uh, not used as frequently outside of the Genesis account. We're, we're to think of, of kinship there. Um, and I, uh, it seems to me that, that for our kind, uh, something like a, a grouping that is family, yes, and our, our uh, local communities or clans, but there's some larger grouping that is part of our kind that uh, scripture speaks of as the peoples or the nation. And that that uh, is also part of this unique reality that is humankind, mm -hmm. and that there is a healing of that there's a healing of the inner heart and of the family and of um, these smaller groupings, but there's a healing of the nations, uh, and the tree of life will be that healing. Yeah, yeah, no, that's lovely. Maybe we could take a closer look at Dr. Long's fourth question. Um, I take it yes. we're asking sort of how do we know when we are operating within the limits of nature, and yeah, there's a sort of definitional question as to the nature of work, right. and there's also a sort of pragmatic question, if I'm understanding the question correctly, how do we actually navigate this? Um, you know, who, in a sense, it's a question who decides, and how can we, you know, as a community, actually put into place certain mm -hmm. constraints that govern our, our life together? I, I, yes, and we have um, it, questions we could add to that about the place of religion in the public arena. Uh, 
uh, in what way uh, scripture can be a governing ideal for national policy. Um, I, one of the things that is um, particularly poignant to me, and I had a chance to think about this as I was working on this essay, uh, is the, the revolutionary nature of writing that was done in the 19th and early 20th century about <coughs> labor. Uh, this, it, we are in an iron age, mm. uh, in my view, compared to <coughs> Rerum Navarro. Mm -hmm. uh, just, just pick up that encycl uh, in, encyclical and read it and be shocked by how direct, mm -hmm. how forthright it is. That description of uh, people going into a factory to work in which the object, the raw material, comes out ennobled and the human person comes out immiserated. Mm -hmm. And it is a, a shockingly uh, concrete portrait of what labor is like mm -hmm. for the great majority of people uh, on this earth. And I think the encyclicals that have been written uh, every 40 years after that are also remarkable, including Pachem and Terras and um, uh, Fides and Ratio. Um, but I think if, if we look at those and look at some of the essays that were written about leisure in the years right around the Second World War, we'll find people thinking about what it would mean for work to be uh, person-forming, for it to be deeply humanizing to work. Uh, and that this is what um, industrialization and uh, now uh, technological uh, finance could mean. It, it could mean that the the elements that have defined work for centuries, um, making uh, objects for human use and um, doing dangerous and dirty work that required all kinds of, um, of human enforcement, um, uh, debt, a serfdom, and of course, uh, slavery, ancient and modern, um, of child labor. The, those things can now be replaced by machines. Uh, but what we need, as uh, Professor Long said so well, is a, a, a political will that is aiming to find in work hmm. this person-forming mm. dimension mm. that is so central to adult human life. How do we do that in such a way that people can be sustained, they have enough income to live a human life, and there is enough work that is person-forming and human-forming for people to do? And it's, it's the modern period that has brought us the concept of unemployment. That's, um, we're, we're so <coughs> used to this being a central concern of every student, uh, of every uh, adult, is whether they can find work. It, it's hard for us to remember that for many, the great majority of centuries of human culture, uh, work was, of course, available because the things that had to be done required enormous human labor. Uh, just to make an article of clothing uh, or to build a wagon wheel uh, or to harvest crops took absolutely everybody in a village. But we are now at a point where we don't require workers for daily tasks. And if, uh, is this a moment where our, our ethical and religious teachings can transform the purpose of work, can bring it somewhere closer 
Terrarum Navarum. Mm -hmm. it, it seems as though I, I, I teach a course in theology and economics, and I've always been able to, until this year, I was unsuccessful at dissuading students that they should think of their education in terms of ROI, return on investment, which uh -huh. is a, you know, mm -hmm. a, a quantifiable measurement of why do you, why do you get an education? And uh, it really yeah. troubled me that this, this generation of students, is, they're so thoroughly corrupt. Uh, no, I don't, I don't know. But, but, you know. but I think they've been led this way, to think of their education as an ROI. Now, I understand that in, in part. I mean, you do want your children at some point when you send them off to be able to support themselves uh, somehow. So I understand that. But I'm wondering if, do you think that part of the difficulty in, in really understanding creation, uh, we were, David and I were talking with you earlier about there's a, there's a kind of natural aesthetic in your work. There's a, there's a beauty to it. It's not, oh, I shouldn't say that. Well, okay. It's not like reading the analytic philosophy where there's, you know, it's like, <laughs> and there's some very, Much is, good Tom, there. is Tom McCall here? Oh, good, good. I'm okay. I'm okay. <laughs> Tom's an exception. It's all right. Um, but I mean, I mean, there's a beauty to it that just kind of captures, and I, I mean, I've always thought that kind of came from your life as a priest as well, that there's this mystery that, that you're trying to inhabit in your theology, which, which comes, much like Bard and even von Balthasar, I find. Yeah, but I'm wondering beautiful. if the increased quantification of everything uh, is really, a, a, you know, is the dominance of the artificial against any possibility of natural mm. constraints. Mm. If mm. somehow to get an adequate doctrine of creation, we'd have to challenge the idea that everything can be quantified. Mm. We'd have to stop mm. doing outcomes assessments uh, in, in uh, a number of other things that we do as a way to measure um, success. Mm. Mm -hmm. Right, and this gives us a chance to think uh, about the limit concept <coughs> and the notion of natural constraint. Uh, and I, I do believe there is such, there is natural constraint. I think this is something um, that I have had a chance to think more about uh, with uh, Kathy Tanner, who's, who's inclined in, in Christ the Key to argue that uh, what it is to be human is to be inexhaustibly uh, creative, mm -hmm. that there is no human nature, that there is this uh, infinite plasticity, uh, which is a very enticing and powerful idea. I, th I think uh, Kathy's work is superb. I, but I believe that uh, Genesis teaches us there is a natural constraint. It, it is significant that we are fashioned uh, on the sixth day and that we are in, uh, in Genesis 2 fashioned uh, from the uh, ground by the Lord's hands. Um, I, I think um, one of the, our, our tasks, it seems to me, in um, Christian formation, in our, our prayer life, in our life of love and service to our neighbors, is uh, to be shaped by the uh, spirit of the living God in such a way uh, that we come to love nature. It's, it's not actually, I think, an easy task to mm -hmm. do it. Mm -hmm. to, to love the fact that we're embodied, mm -hmm. that, that this body is aging, mm -hmm. and there are things that I can't do, that I once did without thinking, uh, that I will have diseases and they will be more serious, uh, that I will suffer. Uh, those, those things are, are part of natural constraint that in one way I am mm. to love. I, th I think your, your wife is right. That I don't think that um, Genesis teaches me that I am uh, to hate morphine after a surgery. Uh, but, I, it, but I think there is something about the natural uh, that is not uh, infinitely plastic. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it is not exactly as I would like. Um, it is given me 
Uh, and there are things I, I endure. It's, it's uh, as Dionysius says, uh, uh, suffering to mind things, uh, mm. uh, undergoing them and uh, bearing them with patience. Uh, that, I think, is a, uh, a spiritual ascesis, a, mm. a spiritual discipline. Mm. And I, I think probably with limit concept, but also with natural constraint, there's not a, I think, a particular rule that we follow in order to apply these. I think it's a wisdom that we seek. Uh, and this is part of what uh, the Christian community, what the uh, wisdom of the saints, uh, what the science of the blessed is to, um, is to learn from them. Uh, how the nat natural is to be loved and cherished and um, in some ways to be obeyed, mm -hmm. to, to be heeded. Mm -hmm. uh, I think uh, I'll just give an example that has long troubled me I, and see what you think. That there is um, a creature that um, at one time was called the Harvard Mouse. It, it was um, uh, a laboratory mouse that had been uh, genetically altered so that it will produce tumors uh, that then can be treated medically and it's used in medical research. And of course, great good comes from this. Um, but that, um, the Harvard mouse requires a change in the, the stem cell of the mouse so that it, by nature now, by second nature, it will generate um, cancerous tumors. Now, I think this is a violation of the natural constraint of an animal. I, I don't think we should do this. Mm. Um, and I don't think we should do it, though it produces great good. Um, and th that's an example of my reading of the hexameron, of the six days of creation. Um, and I think um, other ethicists would read this in a different way. And, and the point of, of Christian conversation is to discern that path ahead. It, is that a, a violation of a natural constraint and a natural dignity mm. of the creatures that are poured forth from the earth? If I could, that, that's very helpful. And you raised this in your uh, presentation as well. When do we, I mean, let, let's take the, 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 I don't know much about the CRISPR gene. I know there's in the mm -hmm. gene modification therapy that's, that's taking place right now in scientific uh, world, uh, but what I've been told is within the next 10 years, using this gene manipulation, you won't have to have a kidney transplant. Your kidney will be able to, your diseased kidney will be able to take care of itself mm -hmm. because of mm -hmm. this gene manipulation. Now, that's artificial, but it seems like it's also natural, but drawing mm -hmm. the border between right. them. So, right. I mean, the mouse case, since you're actually doing harm, yeah. It seems to me that that's one thing. Right. But what about this? Yeah, and what about the cochlear implant yeah. that, that uh, is a computer that becomes <coughs> naturalized? It, it becomes part of your brain? Um, and, I, and I think this kind of uh, genetic manipulation is, is going to introduce the artificial into the natural right. in such a right. way that these categories are starting to blur, and that, that's yeah. part of, I think, what people mean by transhumanism. I, um, I, my own guess is, um, I, from, I uh, remember my last uh, uh, science class is in 1968. <laughs> so <laughs> my guess is, uh, that we will find there will be a natural constraint mm -hmm. to these uh, genetic manipulations, that um, some of these will work and some of them will not. I think this is what we found in the cloning uh, mm -hmm. experiments. <coughs> that there were constraints there, 
that we didn't anticipate about the uh, way in which the body ages, uh, the interconnection of organs, and the way in which the body in, in truth functions as it um, is reproduced and flourishes. So my guess is that's not going yeah, to work yeah. as we imagine. Yeah. Uh, but I, that's going to require, doing it is going to require our thinking about what human nature is and uh, what should be done and what shouldn't. And, and this, I think, requires our, our thinking deeply about how to love nature. Why don't I bring in a few questions from the audience? A number of them have already been addressed in the conversation so far. Um, but here's a question uh, that's been asked. The suggestion that biblical city building can be illuminated by the days of creation is intriguing. Could you clarify how you see this relation playing itself out? Uh, thank you. I, my, my thought was that um, you know, uh, you know, I said in shorthand, uh, Bard has this, this genius idea about relating creation and covenant, uh, not assimilating them. They're not mm -hmm. the same thing, but they're not separate. Uh, but they exist as inner and outer basis of the world we inhabit. Now, that relationship made me think, uh, perhaps there is something about the hexameron the relation of these six days to the rest of scripture. This is one of the interesting things about the opening of scripture is that uh, the Old Testament has its own Old Testament. And it has its own um, pre-story mm. that leads to the uh, calling of Abraham and the establishment of uh, David as king of the united monarchy and the, um, the days subsequent to Solomon. Uh, now, what is the relationship of that trajectory, that history, the Psalms, the Proverbs, the wisdom literature, the prophetic oracles that emerge from uh, Genesis 15 forward through scripture and uh, King David's greater son. What is the relation of that to the creation and uh, formation and fall stories in the opening of Genesis up through Babel and the flood? Uh, now, my thought is that one of the ways we might think about this structure is to say that we are seeing a relationship between the cultural and built and the natural. Mm -hmm. And we see foreshadows of that, I'm suggesting, in the hexameron itself. Uh, it seems to me that the relation there is one in which the um, the city, the people, uh, is a light to the nations, and that our uh, life before God in the midst of this people, either as the, um, the born members of the people or the ones engrafted into it, uh, that our uh, relationship is to live peaceably in these cities, to be a light to the nations, and to consider the lilies of the field how they grow. Uh, now that's, uh, the, that is, I'm suggesting that the, uh, the uh, moral and historical and prophetic teachings have a relationship to the uh, days of creation in which we are taught how to love nature, how to live within it, how to be the natural creatures who are culture bearers by uh, living out this life of discipleship. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There's another question here about 
what are some practical and concrete ways we can know when technology has um, broken out of the bounds of nature? And maybe we could even sort of particularize that. You mentioned smartphones and computers and so on and so forth. Um, what would be the indicator that would tell us when we've allowed this technology to sort of break out of its proper place? I would, um no, I mean, there's, um, there are a number of um, spiritual tests that I try to use myself in, in my own examination of conscience. Um, is my prayer life affected? That's a, a very um, concrete and specific question that I think we don't uh, dare to ask ourselves very often. And has it become harder to um, read scripture spiritually? Has it become more difficult to do a lectio mm. with scripture? Is it more difficult to concentrate in my prayers? Are they shorter? Um, uh, am I thinking, you know, I could answer one more email. <laughs> This is a, um, a kind of spiritual discrimin that is, is personal, but I think is helpful in seeing whether technology has become my master or not. Uh, I, th I think in a, a larger, in a, a greater corporate sense, uh, we might ask whether um, the things that benefit uh, computers and that express computers and technology that is associated with them, uh, have they become the governing elements in a decision? That is, are we thinking efficiency is the highest good? Mm. That, I think that's a sign that the artificial has overcome the natural uh, because the natural is not efficient. Uh, this is this is what we're seeing in the six days of creation. This this lavish outpouring of life that is far more than is needed. Over and over, nature is making uh, one puffball. Uh, <laughs> fungus is making thousands of spores. Uh, it, it's just this uh, uh, prodigal pouring forth of life and. Uh, so, if efficiency is now our constant hallmark, mm. I, I think we can suspect that technology is dictating our decisions. Uh, or if we think uh, that the uh, most significant uh, element in our decision is whether it's uh, competitive, uh, whether we've um, We've uh, found a, uh, a niche and we are honoring that. Uh, that, I think, also is uh, born of the um, world, the cultural and economic world that we live in. Mm. And I, I would use those as diagnostics mm -hmm. myself. Another question, this time geared a little bit towards pastoral practice. So I think I tend to assume that we as late moderns lack an imagination for the very category of nature. Mm -hmm. And if that's Probably. true, that means um, the persons sitting in our pews um, have been, you know, have already undergone a kind of cultural catechesis in which the very the concepts that you're using here are are alien. And so, mm -hmm. what does it look like to apply back pressure to that? To to catechize? Mm -hmm. um, to reform? sort of rekindle an imagination for givenness over against, you know, predominant emphasis upon plasticity, these sorts of things. Yeah, right. It, um, is there a way in which we hybrid creatures can uh, actually uh, remember our kinship with the other creatures of the sixth day uh, in such a way that it informs our life in cities and suburbs where the great majority of, of human creatures live now. Mm -hmm. um, seems to me that we might 
do that in a, a couple of ways. Um, but one is thinking about uh, embodiment, uh, about, um, about illness, and about dying. Uh, they, these are central parts of our natural existence mm -hmm. uh, that we in post-industrial societies have had a harder and harder time talking about. Mm. We have a harder time in our congregations talking about um, things that must be born, things, uh, things that we undergo, that we uh, must learn to patiently endure. I, I think uh, we have been inclined uh, to talk about what the, the solutions are, uh, how to make that better, how to make it go away, um, or at least to distract us from it. Uh, but it, it may be that we need in our Christian life to say that part of what being made on the sixth day is, is that there are things that we simply live with and that uh, uh, God will in some way ennoble them to mm. us. Mm -hmm. um, and that um, uh, dressing our souls for death, th this is mm -hmm. one of the spiritual tasks that our ancestors did so well. Uh, and they had people die at home. They had seen dead bodies. They had seen death. Um, and we know um, hospital rooms. Uh, we know other people. We hire other people to take care of the suffering and dying. Mm. And there, there is good in that. It's, um, I think um, always we should be uh, um, wary of things that say, uh, this is totally wrong and only this is right. Mm -hmm. but, I, but I do think uh, thinking about the fact that being embodied means uh, ultimately uh, dying, that, the, that this is part of our uh, coming to recognize nature and the natural. Mm. Uh, and, it, and it may be also that simply uh, uh, preaching about nature will be of great healing good, great uh, power for us um, because for so many of us nature is a, a poster in a dorm room. Hmm. It's, it's, a, it's an idea. Mm -hmm. It's a place we visit on our, our two-week vacation. Uh, but actually preaching creation might be, hmm. might be a, a help. I wonder if recovering, oddly enough, pilgrimage mm. would mm. help. Right. Um, right. Uh, just because we're, I mean, I love speed. I just love it. I'm sure I'm conditioned. I'm sure it's been a catechesis. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but something like a pilgrimage actually slows you down. Mm -hmm. Just the importance of pilgrimage in the Christian tradition for so long right. that you would go off and walk and talk to other human beings and, and pray. Um, there's still practice regularly around the world, but... Um, right. Mm -hmm. Right, and, and think of the uh, conclusion of a pilgrimage. You, you went to a sanctuary that was um, polychrome, beautifully colored the way almost nothing was in your ordinary life as a um, peasant or lay person, and, uh, and you, uh, you sat in the presence of someone's holy bones. That, um, now, we might, um, we might have lots of different uh, theologies about, um, about sainthood and about relics, but uh, one of the aspects that I think is, is lost in our um, more prosaic accounts of the religious life is the idea that there's something about um, the physical, the natural body that also can bear holiness. Mm. It's, um, it's a very interesting idea. It's, it's uh, not simply our 
our souls are, are holy. Um, mm -hmm. It's not simply an inwardness, though of course I prize inwardness, but, it, but there is something about living a life that is moving toward God, that, that loves God, that transforms the very natural body, mm -hmm. and that mm -hmm. that can be in some way honored. That's a wonderful idea, and of course, uh, walking, thinking, uh, think of Luther walking to Rome. Um, this is, uh, I mean, we just uh, can't imagine things like that. This is, was ordinary monastic business of the canons, uh, and they were sending someone to do uh, Augustan canon work in Rome, and so the solution was to send Luther and some friends, and they walked across the Alps to Rome. That's one way you get to Rome. That's, uh, yeah. Here's another question raised from a member of the audience. How would greater reflection on the person and work of Christ further inform the way forward concerning the challenges of technology raised at the end of your talk? Yeah. Yeah, that's right. I mean, I, I wanted to give um, some signal of the uh, Christological um, telos of this whole pattern by speaking of uh, Bethlehem and the house of bread and David's son. Uh, I, I think uh, one of the, the things we're, we're seeing in the, in the life of Jesus Christ is uh, is not only his um, dwelling both in the city. He, he is moving from Capernaum to Jerusalem, and he is in the great city of the earth, Jerusalem. Um, so we're seeing someone who is faithful and the faithful witness in the midst of the built environment and the complex relation of Zion to uh, his own ministry. Uh, and we are also seeing someone who considers the lilies of the field, mm. how they grow, mm. uh, who clearly is a, um, a, a person who has grown up in the natural world and who loves it, and whose parables are not only about kings, but about those who dress the vineyard, and who raise crops and treat the fig tree. Uh, and I, I think there we're seeing in his, um, in his stories, his parables, a mixture of the natural and the artificial. Uh, the cultural mm. that mm -hmm. uh, are deeply instructive. I, I think also the one of the significant elements about the uh, life of Jesus Christ and his witness is that it is not over. I think this is something we we don't call upon enough in our uh, devotional and doctrinal life, uh, that um, that he is raised uh, means not only that uh, death is overcome, this, this protest against dying and the victory over it, but also that he now reigns. He is in the heavenly places um, uh, seated as king. Mm. So, uh, so these questions about technology that we have uh, can be brought to him, uh, can be addressed to him in uh, prayer and petition. Uh, and I think he will have counsel for his church. Mm. This may be asking for a sneak preview of your systematics too, which is on its way, I know. Um, but, but you also made some references to the doctrine of the Trinity, and this gets at the Christological right. question right. as well. As you, as you note that creation itself is lavish, we really mm. don't need a God who's one and three and three and one. I mean, you know, people do right. quite well with just a single God. You mm -hmm. can get a lot done with a, a single God. 
Right. Um, I mean, we, we have a single God. I know God is one. It's part of the confession. Uh, yeah. but, but, but is there, <laughs> if we're made in this image of God, and I always worry about these kinds of arguments because I know uh, back in the 70s there was this popular, you know, the Trinity shows us that we have to be capitalists. It shows we have to be socialists. It shows we have to be everything. Uh, yeah. And you just, right. after a while, it died of boredom. But is there, is there something about the doctrine of the Trinity and the fact that we're made in the image of God, this generativity, mm. which you will draw mm -hmm. upon in your second volume to yeah. address that, to help us understand creation? Yeah, I do. Um, I'm, I'm hoping to uh, set forth a doctrine of Trinity that calls upon the holiness school uh, as the foundational text. So the holiness of God, I think, is the uh, mm, capstone and ground mm -hmm. of God's triunity. And I think holiness involves uh, a austerity, but also uh, a lavishness, uh, a, a superabundance. Mm -hmm. uh, it involves a concreteness and an abstraction. Uh, there is particularity and universality in holiness. Mm -hmm. uh, and those, I think, are the building blocks of Trinity. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think we have time for just one final question. <coughs> and, uh, the question is this, in what way is the gospel better news than transhumanism? Um, I, uh, our, uh -huh. our mutual friend, um, Brent Waters, has debated transhumanists, and he always jokes that the transhumanist is sort of like Amazon that can give you whatever you want, and Christianity <laughs> is the, the ma and pop store that says, if we don't have it, you don't need it. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, but, you know, the, the sort of allure of human enhancement um, uh, it's, it, right. Where, where do, how do we That's apply back question. pressure to that? That's mm. a good question. Mm. That, uh, that really wonderfully uh, brings us uh, back ab ovum to this question of restraint and limits. Uh, w one of the uh, questions before us, I think, is whether uh, we can uh, love the law. Do, do we um, actually uh, love the fact that we are placed in a world in which um, there are three people here on this table and we are each particular. Mm -hmm. We're not uh, ultimately malleable, but are this very mm -hmm. one. Mm -hmm. And that that is a good thing. Mm -hmm. It's a good thing that I am not Steve and David. And, mm -hmm. I, uh, and that I am going to have uh, uh, capacities and vocations and ideas that are not theirs and less than theirs. That, uh, that's uh, going to be part of my good, is to be less than them. Mm -hmm. And that, uh, I think, uh, coming to see what is good for us and for our kind is uh, part of what allows us to actually love one another, uh, that this uh, particularity, uh, the concrete reality that each of us is, that has limits and uh, flaws and imperfections, things that are incomplete and will never be complete, and that that's part of our good. Mm. That seems to me good news. Mm. Uh, and uh, what lies underneath uh, much of the transhumanism that I know about, uh, and uh, certainly this um, plastic surgery phenomenon, is a profound dissatisfaction with who we are, mm. uh, with uh, how I look, uh, and with how I was born, and what it is my parents gave me as my genetic inheritance. Um, and that I must always be better. I must be perfect or on the way to perfect, mm. scheduled for perfection in some way. And um, I think the gospel is this great news that, yeah, that's not the goal. Mm. That's not the goal. Wow. Well, please join me in thanking our uh, speakers, Professor Long and Professor Conrad. Thank you. Thank you.